Well, welcome to News of the Day, a special feature of Stars, Cells, and God, where we talk about an emerging breakthrough discovery in science that has implications for both philosophy, theology, and the Christian faith. I'm Hugh Ross. I'm the founder of Reasons to Believe and a trained as an astrophysicist, also served on the pastoral staff of a church between Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, I want to begin... Uh, with a Bible text from the book of Job, Job 38, verses 19 and 20. What is the way to the abode of light? Where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwelling? And the discovery I want to talk about was published in Physical Review Letters uh, just a week ago. Uh, The title, Primordial Black Holes with QCD uh, Color Charge. QCD, uh, standing for Quantum Chromodynamics, written by two theoretical physicists, Elba Alonzo uh, Monsalve and uh, David, uh, yeah, David Kaiser. Thank you. Well, as I've read in the scriptures about uh, dark stuff, uh, Job talks about the dark stuff. And uh, today we know that the universe is predominantly made up of dark stuff, dark energy and dark matter. In fact, it's 99.73% dark stuff. And, uh, you know, in Job's time, we had no idea that this dark stuff existed to that extent and certainly not its location. Today, and what I mean by today is in the past few decades, we've been able to discern that indeed, Dark stuff is a dominant component of the universe, and we actually know where the dark matter now resides. So yeah, the dark energy is the energy embedded in the space surface of the universe that causes that space surface to accelerate in extent. Uh, Dark matter refers to uh, matter made up of stuff that does not interact with light or very weakly interacts with light. Contrast with ordinary matter, the matter that we're all made up of, protons, neutrons, and electrons, that has the property that it does strongly interact with light. And astronomers have been able to tell uh, by the gravitational influences they see in the universe how much of this dark matter exists and where it resides. And so uh, the first slide I got here basically shows you the cosmic web And you see that the structure of the universe, the matter of the universe, is distributed along what looks like a whole bunch of densely packed uh, soap soap bubbles. And the next slide actually shows you, uh, zooming in on these individual soap bubbles, how the ordinary matter, matter made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons, is predominantly distributed on the surfaces of these bubbles, And then the dark matter that doesn't interact with light is in the interior of these bubbles. Uh, And so, and then when we look at our Milky Way galaxy, if I can show the next slide, it basically shows you just how much the dark matter influences things. There's about five and a half times as much dark matter as there is ordinary matter. And so here in our Milky Way galaxy, looking down in the galaxy, you can see the spiral structure. The light gray part uh, basically shows you the ordinary matter that doesn't emit light. Then surrounding it is the dark matter, this huge halo of dark matter. And so uh, the stars, the spiral structure of our Milky Way galaxy extends out about 100 to 120,000 light years in diameter. Uh, The dark matter halo that encompasses our Milky Way galaxy uh, goes out 1.9 million light years in diameter, almost halfway uh, to the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. Now, our Milky Way galaxy is exceptional and it has uh, a, a great quantity of dark matter. We've got twice as much dark matter surrounding our galaxy, actually four times as much as what surrounds the Andromeda galaxy. It actually explains why the spiral arm structure of our Milky Way galaxy is so extremely symmetrical and stable, crucial features for life. So astronomers actually do have a good sense of how much dark matter there is. Uh, It makes up about 23% of all the stuff of the universe, five times more abundant than the ordinary matter, and we actually know where it resides. 
in these different locations within the universe. But the big mystery has been what makes up this dark matter? And that's where this paper comes into play. These two theoretical physicists say, we think we've got some new insights on what composes uh, this dark matter and how this could actually lead to a much deeper understanding of the physics of the universe and the cosmic creation event. And uh, so what's been going on for the past five decades is astronomers and physicists are pursuing what they thought was the most likely composition of dark energy that is made up of fundamental particles. Uh, but these particles interact very weakly with light, so they're extremely difficult to, to, to detect. Nevertheless, both physicists and astronomers using uh, telescopes, and in the case of physicists using the CERN particle accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, in an attempt to find axions, uh, which has been presumed to be the most likely candidate to make up the particles composing dark matter. Another one has been sterile neutrinos. But so far, uh, all the attempts to detect the particles that make up uh, dark uh, matter have, uh, have not proven successful. Now, those searches are continuing to go on, and as physicists and astronomers point out, we didn't expect this to be easy because these particles so weakly interact with light. Uh, but what these two theoretical physicists are saying, that you know, we're not throwing uh, water, uh, you know, casting dispersion on this idea that they're made up of these particles, but we think there could be something else that comprises uh, this dark matter, which could actually help explain why we've had such difficulty trying to detect the particles. And what they're speaking about are primordial black holes. Now, primordial black holes are tiny black holes uh, that would form before protons and neutrons form in the universe. And so we're talking about uh, the first, uh, you know, 10 quadrillionth of a second after the cosmic creation event. So earlier than 10 to the minus 16 seconds after the cosmic creation event, you've got the possibility uh, that gluons and quarks. Now, protons and neutrons are basically made up of quarks. Uh, so, you know, you get three quarks coming together to make a proton, and it's the gluons that hold together the quarks in a proton. Uh, but you don't get protons and neutrons forming until the universe is about a 10 millionth of a second old. And so before that time, you've got these gluons and uh, quarks uh, freely running around in the universe. Uh, and what these two physicists are pointing out is that when you get previous to 10 to the minus 16 seconds after the cosmic creation event, you have the possibility uh, that these gluons and uh, quarks uh, will come together and coalesce, and when they do, uh, their gravitational pull will actually draw in some virtual particles, and that you'll get these things forming to such a degree that you get these microscopic black holes forming. And, uh, and they basically are pointing out that uh, between 10 to the minus 16 seconds after the cosmic creation event and 10 to the minus 22 seconds after the cosmic creation event is a window in which you can get these gluons and quarks and virtual particles coalescing uh, to make black holes. And uh, they're basically saying uh, what you'll get are black holes forming that are no bigger than the size of an atom. So they're the size of the atom, and, uh, but they weigh uh, approximately the masses of the moons of Jupiter, uh, you know, Jup pardon me, moons of Mars. Mars has got two moons, Phobos and Deimos. They're small moons. And uh, this last slide here basically shows you a comparison of the moon that orbits the Earth and the two moons that orbit Mars. So you can see they're much tinier than our moon. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we're talking a lot of mass uh, within Deimos and uh, Phobos. And uh, these black holes uh, that Alfonso uh, and uh, Kaiser are talking about, uh, Alonzo uh, talking about, uh, they're um, just the size of an atom, but they contain the mass of, say, Deimos or Phobos. So a lot of mass packed into just the volume of uh, an atom. 
But they also point out in their paper that when these uh, primordial black holes form, uh, you get, as a byproduct, a tinier black hole forming. And now we're talking about black holes uh, that are smaller than a proton. You know, atoms are much bigger than protons. Atoms are, you know, protons and neutrons with electrons surrounding them, where the electrons are orbiting far away uh, from the nucleus. So now we're talking something tinier than a proton. In fact, we're talking black holes that have a diameter that's one ten thousandth the diameter of a proton. So an incredibly tiny object, but packed into that very tiny uh, volume is the mass of a ton. So a whole ton of uh, matter is squished in uh, to something that's 10,000 times smaller than the diameter of a proton. And they point out in their paper uh, that those very tiny black holes uh, will evaporate uh, once you get protons and neutrons forming. So they don't hang around. But they say the bigger black holes, the black holes that are the size of an atom and weigh the mass of Deimos or Phobos, they will hang around, hang around to the present time, and therefore they could actually explain uh, a good fraction, maybe even the totality, of the uh, dark matter that we see in the universe today. And so they're saying maybe it isn't particles, maybe it's these primordial black holes. They also point out that uh, their theory allows for a combination of these primordial black holes and particles. So saying, let's not abandon the search to find, uh, to discover axions, for example. Let's pursue that, but recognize that we don't find enough axions to explain the totality of dark matter. These primordial black holes might make up the difference. They could even make up the totality. Now, astronomers have been speculating about primordial black holes ever since Stephen Hawking proposed their possible existence back in 1970. Uh, however, all of their proposals so far have been purely theoretical. Uh, what I find uh, special about this paper is they end the paper by saying there's actually ways that we can prove whether or not our theory is correct. And so they end their paper with three different observational tests that could establish whether or, need, whether or not uh, these primordial black holes actually do make up a significant fraction, perhaps even the totality of the dark matter that we see. And the three that they propose is number one, uh, that uh, the decay of these very tiny black holes, the ones that are much smaller than the diameter of a proton, uh, would actually have the effect of influencing uh, the ripples that we see, the gravitational wave ripples that we see uh, when two black holes merge together uh, to become a bigger black hole. And we already have gravity wave telescopes that are detecting the gravity waves from black holes that merge together to become a bigger black hole. But what they point out in the paper, the currently existing gravity wave telescopes are not sensitive enough to see the tiny ripple effects uh, from these primordial black holes. But they said the next generation of gravity wave telescopes that will come online within a few years will have the necessary sensitivity. So that's one way we could prove whether or not primordial black holes actually provide the answer to what makes up this dark matter. A second way to look at it is that uh, these uh, primordial black holes will cause another ripple effect in the cosmic background radiation. And there again, uh, we got new instruments coming online that have the potential sensitivity uh, to see these ripples that would be generated in the cosmic space-time fabric. And the last of all, they point out that uh, core to Big Bang cosmology is that the universe begins with only one element, hydrogen, uh, but the universe starts off infinitesimally small and nearly infinitely hot, but it's expanding. And as it expands, it goes through the temperature window in which nuclear fusion can occur, uh, where the hydrogen, uh, at least part of that hydrogen, is fused into helium. And, uh, you know, astronomers have been making these measurements for 60 years, noting, for example, that within the first three minutes after the cosmic creation event, about one quarter of all the primordial hydrogen gets fused into helium, 
and the future stars begin to take that 25% helium and 75% hydrogen, and the nuclear furnaces in the stars fuse all the other elements we see in the periodic table. And what the two authors here point out is that um, if indeed these primordial black holes exist, it will have a very tiny influence on the quantity of helium uh, that is produced within the three, first three minutes after the cosmic creation event. And once again, we don't yet have the sensitivity to see the effect that would be generated by these primordial black holes, uh, but emerging technology will have that. And so this paper really gives us a motivation. Let's pursue the development of these new technological, uh, advancing the technology in these instruments so that we could use three different ways of proving whether or not, indeed, this is the answer. This answers the mystery of what makes up the dark matter. And solving that mystery uh, will actually give us more appreciation for what we see in Job 38, verses 19 and 20. Not only do we know that the dark stuff is real, how much of it exists, where it resides, but we know what makes up that dark matter. And actually, with these three instrumental advances, we'll actually be able to develop a far more accurate and precise Big Bang creation model, uh, which, of course, will enhance our confidence in what the Bible has predicted thousands of years ago. It wasn't astronomers back in the 1920s that first talked about the Big Bang creation event. It was the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament describes uh, at least three, if not four, fundamental features of the Big Bang creation event. And you can read an article I've got up at uh, reasons.org that talks about what the Bible says uh, about the Big Bang thousands of years ago. It was posted in uh, uh, 2023. And also uh, in the show notes here, I uh, give you a link uh, to an article I wrote just a few months ago that talks about uh, these primordial black holes and how they would affect our understanding of creation and potentially give us a more precise cosmic uh, creation model. And that paper also gives you a link uh, to the other article I wrote about how the Bible uh, predicted these Big Bang features thousands of years ago.